of course, is a member of multiple industry organizations, ASTM committees, and numerous papers on air purification. Third, but not the least, uh, Joel Tenney, and I always say he has a fabulously exciting product line uh, that spans across multiple, multiple uh, areas, and we'll, we'll touch on some of that. So Joel is managing partner of ICA Trinova. Mr. Tenney has over 30 years of experience in the chemical industry. He's held roles in engineering management, R&D, and commercial development. His current responsibilities include government relations, sales and marketing and product support for ICA, controlled chemical release products. Mr. Tenney has extensive knowledge and experience in oxidation chemistries used in water disinfection, bio threat responses, food safety, security, and animal health. Mr. Tenney holds a master's from Georgia Institute of Technology a bachelor in chemical engineering, a bachelor's in chemical engineering from Michigan State University, and an MBA from Kennesaw State University. So thank you everybody. Thanks for joining the session. Uh, really privileged that I'm you know, organizing this session. Uh, have three very uh, you know, different and diverse businesses here. So hopefully the attendees will get a good flavor of uh, different areas in this time of need. Uh, first, I want to thank each of you for joining us. I know these are extremely busy times for you because uh, your businesses have literally skyrocketed. And uh, so I, I appreciate you taking one hour off is one hour that you'd spend on growing the business more. So I do appreciate that. Uh, so the participants, I, I thought we'd, we'd go in a way where we have uh, Jennifer, we, we'd let you go first and then Kevin and then Joel, uh, same question so that we can have the you know rotating answers. So towards that, uh, could you, in your words, of course, I've given a bio, you know, bio of, of the company and yourself from the booklet. Could you, in your words, tell us a little bit about your company uh, and some of the work that your company does? Jennifer, if you would, please. Sure. And Hoshi, thank you for the lovely introduction and um, nice to, to meet fellow panelists. Um, we manufacture a device for uh, needle pain relief, and I literally have it in my hand. It's um, unlike uh, the other industries represented here. We have a, a, um, a device that's a consumer device that's also um, designed for um, the healthcare industry. Its primary job is to block needle pain. So uh, especially right now in connection with uh, developing a COVID vaccine, and of course, multiple um, trials going on around the globe, uh, a quarter of a million people involved in, in vaccine trials. There's a heck of a lot of people realizing that they just don't like needles. And in order to keep people compliant with whether it be uh, existing vaccine re regimens or what we expect to be a, a, a future COVID vaccine, um, our device is positioned to, uh, to, to maintain compliance, uh, to bring people into the, the, the healthcare, or to bring them sort of under the, the healthcare umbrella where they otherwise might be avoiding healthcare. They might have a history of not having visited the doctor for years and years and years because they just have had negative experiences. So we are um, very much in, on the patient satisfaction side of things. Um, this is obviously an adorable uh, bee, but it's a functioning medical device and it's classified and regu regulated accordingly. So um, there are uh, challenges associated with exporting an FDA registered device. Um, there are challenges associated with our device not being absolutely essential to the vaccine delivery process. So um, those are ch challenges that are amplified a little bit during these challenging times. But um, just one, one more thing is that we're not just a needle pain relief company. We realized a few years ago that people are using our vibration and ice technology to block other forms of pain like uh, knee pain, joint pain, overuse injuries, and even to recover after, um, after surgery, for example, a, a knee replacement as a, as a, as a, as a way to avoid um, not necessarily all opioids, but to potentially reduce the need for those um, drugs that we that none of us wants to take more than is absolutely necessary. Thank you, Jennifer. That was that was very interesting. Uh, they they hear my voice when I'm always struck by a needle in the next room. So I, I think this is something I could definitely use. Yeah. Again, uh, not just for kids. There are a lot of adults who are who do not uh, who do not enjoy those procedures. <laughs> right. Right. 
Kevin, could, could you go next and tell us a little bit about Pure Air? Sure, yes. Um, I, I think Jennifer probably has a far more interesting product for individuals uh, to consider, but um, our product is, is very, uh, uh, it's a B2B uh, um, uh, type applications. We are helping in a lot of different areas industrially and commercially to improve air purification uh, or to improve air quality. Um, Typical applications range from uh, purifying the air inside of industrial facilities, uh, typically not on smokestacks, but to purify the air inside of facilities to protect them from themselves. So at very, very um, heavy uh, industrial facilities, we will purify the air inside to protect critical electronics that are operating the facility. Uh, we also uh, provide odor control systems at wastewater treatment plants. For, so uh, I don't think anybody uh, takes uh, has any uh, enjoyment in smelling sewage odors. And so we make systems um, that help uh, uh, to reduce that, that odor that is leaving the sewage treatment facility and, and going out into the neighborhoods nearby. We also make systems for toxic gas removal. So if a customer happens to have a quantity of a, a large toxic gas that's on hand that's needed for um, for many different purposes. A typical application would be a chlorine, which is used to disinfect water. It's used in very low doses in the water, but you have to keep a high dose of it while, where you're uh, uh, injecting it. Um, and we provide systems that are used as a standby system in case there should be a problem. Uh, and then uh, the last area or a fourth area is what is kind of a catch-all area, indoor air quality. We protect, we super purify the air inside of buildings. Uh, as Mahushi had mentioned in my introduction, we purify the air inside of museums uh, to super purify the air. Uh, but it could be just as simple as um, a business uh, being tired of smelling the bagel shop down the street and uh, they, they want to, to not smell that any longer. And we have the systems that can take that odor out of the air. And I'll mention to you that we, and we'll talk about this most likely coming up, but we have also, uh, because we're used to taking individual molecules out of the air, we're used to working with very, very small particles, individual molecules. And so we have been able to um, adjust our business model a bit and, and begin working on removal of viruses and other mi microbes from the air uh, and have a new product, uh, which has been proven effective against COVID-19. So. Uh, we're very pleased about that. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Joel, could you tell us a little bit about ICA Trinova? Sure. Well, ICA, we've been, um, we've been around for about 20 years. Um, we've been developing what we call controlled release chemical systems. We do a lot of work with oxidative chemistries that um, overlap a little bit with what Kevin was talking about. We do uh, we like to think of air interventions, water and hard surface type of work. Uh, the products that we make cover B2B and a little bit of B2C, but what makes our technology and product formats uh, interesting, I mean, think earlier today we were talking about products that could work in an Indian ready sort of capacity, simple products that provide exceptional value for certain types of needs. Uh, one of the things we focused on a lot is food safety and, and security. Uh, we have uh, EPA registered products where we can treat uh, post harvest grains, we can treat uh, all kinds of different citrus produce, potatoes, things like this. We've done a little bit of work with that technology in India, in the onion market, with some good impact. Uh, we're doing most of our work here today in the United States with respect to food. Uh, in the area of air, we do some overlap with what Kevin was talking about for, for indoor air quality in terms of removing odors and things. Our technology is a little bit different because it's mobile. And so with this latest COVID challenge, uh, that teased out some applications for us with uh, working with first responders, um, medical communities, different markets where uh, they needed to deal with air and service. And we can kind of bring both of those types of interventions to bear. A lot of work with PPE gear interventions, which is pretty unique for the things that we do. Uh, and then a third uh, leg of our stool is, is what we do in, in water. Uh, we have a lot of um, capability to treat water, particularly in third world communities. We do a lot of work in Haiti, Jamaica, where we provide products that uh, disinfect water for uh, small communities. Thank you, Joel. 
and full disclosure, right? I mean, I've known some of you for a while, so I, I, I know what, uh, what path you've taken and how you've grown your companies. Uh, if you feel comfortable, can you share with the audience how you've navigated through uh, in your personal career at the companies that you are at? Hoshi, I think you said you wanted me to go first. Is that correct? Yes, please. Yes, yes. Jennifer, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think you mean my my personal journey to get to Pain Care Labs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I see you. I see you were a lawyer before, and uh, now I see you're doing business development. So that's very interesting. Yeah. So if you it, share with us, you know, what brought brought you here? Yeah. So I have always um I've always studied languages and been very interested in in learning languages and. Uh, you know, when you're young, you have aspirations of being an international business person and without really knowing what that might mean or how that might look. Um, and I would say I very much um, ended up at this company by accident. Um, I would say, uh, I think a couple of you raised your hands for being fellow, um, not necessarily needle phobes, but I am somebody who faints with just about every needle procedure. Um, so I certainly, this is not a natural fit for me to be working for one for a medical device company, two specifically for one that, um, that manages needle pain. Um, but I came to it like many of us get to where we are, which is through networking and connections. And um, I think that's just something that's become so important to all of us, especially during these COVID, COVID times is that you, uh, you have to always have that network warmed up to to, so that you can pivot for that next thing. And for me, it was um, after uh, sort of retiring from practicing law, uh, a few years at home with small children, and then really realizing that I needed to get back in, into the workforce, not necessarily wanting to go back to courtroom work. And a friend of a friend worked for this company and said, I think it might be a great fit for somebody with a legal background and uh, some you know, language interest. Um, and it just, it has blossomed into, into something that I have been able to sort of make my own. Um, mm -hmm. There wasn't really somebody focusing on exports and that's very much something that interested me. Um, so we just started with the sort of um, easy targets, uh, uh, locations with uh, low regulatory barriers and um, uh, no uh, um, language conflict or language difference, I should say. Um, and it's just, it's been, really um a pleasure to to make it my own wow, with lots exciting. of help from so many people in atlanta that's an exciting journey i mean you've touched on a point which i think uh, all of us have realized the benefit of is relationships and that's literally what scared me through the through the pandemic myself and our businesses and uh because you can't go out you can't meet with people it's all the relationship you've formed and now you see the face that's familiar and you hear the voice that's familiar and it makes a big difference. So I, I appreciate what you're what you're saying there. Thank you for sharing that, Kevin. How was how was your journey uh, into into what you're doing today? So uh, I have a, a background in engineering, a couple of degrees from Georgia Tech, and uh, spent uh, I guess my first fifteen years or so in uh, as a manufacturing engineer, quality engineer, and operational aspects of, of various manufacturing um, functions. Um, and I later went to work as a vice president of operations at a company that was in the air purification industry, a company that Hoshi and I worked together at for a period of time and uh, was there about five years and uh, had a falling out with them and was sent on my way and uh, spent some time trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Had always been interested in something entrepreneurial and uh, from uh, with a lot of prodding from my wife uh, was able to figure out uh, how to get some things moving and put together a few deals um, and uh, things have, have blossomed from there and um, uh, that's that's kind of how we've developed and just to figure out the market as as we found opportunities and, and took advantage of them there so I can't say there was any great a big plan in place. We just followed where there was a need. Yeah, and and you know, and you're global. I mean, uh, you've been doing this, uh, you know, not not too long, uh, long enough, but not you know, not you know, forty years, fifty years, like. Uh, but the size of the company that you've built, 
Sure. And uh, the distribution network that you've created globally is just absolutely credit worthy. Yeah, so well, I, I appreciate that. We just for the audience, we have about uh, 35, probably almost 40 employees now. We've actually grown uh, a bit during the COVID period uh, as far as number of employees have gone. And uh, we have an employee in Kuala Lumpur, one in Honolulu, uh, one in Amsterdam. We just opened a uh, an office in Amsterdam, a formal corporation there, and uh, just incorporated in Hong Kong as well, too. So um, all of these are just uh, efforts to expand our reach uh, in these regions. And um, uh, we, we've certainly got a lot of help along the way. Uh, I can tell you that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, good luck to you. Joel, Thanks. how how was your journey? How, how did you, because I've seen you do this for a few years, you've gotten so many approvals at the you know, at the regulatory agencies, you know, just fascinating what you've gone through. Can you share with us? It, it, it's the big part of the journey. And I can sympathize with Jennifer when she talks about regulatory constraint. But when we started the company, <clears throat> I, I spent my career working for big chemical companies. And, and uh, some of the chemistries I dealt with were at a scale that really worked industrially, but didn't really port down to other communities of opportunity. And when I came across the platform, it, it's, I saw opportunities to extend that good chemistry story to new places. Uh, and that's been quite a journey because uh, we're never at, a, at a, a loss to try things. We started the company working in bio threat response. We developed products for the military for dealing with anthrax in the field on gear and different types of um, scenarios that they came up with <clears throat> that they were challenged with. And ever since then, we've had our products at play for every one of the bio threats that we talk about today, including COVID. And really what makes these things unique is their portability. Uh, the food security issue was one that we, you know, I looked at a number of years ago as uh, an emerging challenge, emerging opportunity. And there, there's been an interesting evolution of food security challenges. It started with safety, but now the, the world's looking at food security through new eyes with respect to COVID. Uh, I was on a, um, a UN call sponsored it's the food, uh, great food challenge. And it was talking about what do farmers need in different communities. And there was a group from India on this call and they talked about post-harvest waste challenges for the typical Indian farmer being one of the greatest uh, issues that they have to deal with. And we've successfully developed products that can, can deal with different types of commodities and these problems. So, um, it's been a journey. Uh, we've looked at a lot of different applications, probably too many for a company that was young and starting out. You know, they tell you not to do too much too soon. But, but anyway, I think we're in a good place. And I think, um, you know, our products are teed up uh, to help people in different parts of the world solve problems. Well, thank you. Uh, I mean, thanks to you, Joel. I've been, I've been a part of that same event that you mentioned, the Great Food Challenge Day. And one of the things I learned for the industry that you touch on and you are you know, fundamental to, you said onions in India and, and such, is I think it was the entrepreneur from India and the one from Germany who said, we've made food so affordable and so easily available in supermarkets that we don't think twice before throwing it away. And that never used to be the case before. Yeah. And uh, that, that just know, touched the, me so deeply. Yeah, and now the measure has has morphed into one of uh, you know global climate change, the amount of food that we waste and it turns into the greenhouse gas. So people are paying attention, leading brands. People are looking for solutions that 15 years ago we knew there was a problem, we didn't realize how much it could affect the world. Yeah, and I'm not an expert in this area, but I've, I've I think I've read enough uh, popular publications to realize that it's not the production part. Because I think another example was the Starbucks example, if you recollect, where it said it takes uh, two dollars and fifty euros to, you know, I think the gentleman was from Germany, uh, saying that it takes two dollars and fifty euros for a cup of coffee in Europe, but the actual coffee bean grower gets one cent out of that, and that was another piece of information that blew me away. That there's so much that needs to be done in the food security part. And especially you mentioned India, 1.3 billion people, there's a lot of mouths to feed and we really need to optimize that. So hopefully we can get some connections out of this uh, event and that we can follow up further on that. Uh, next question to each of, so thank you for sharing that opinion, uh, each of you. I have another one. Uh, what, what do you think is the, uh, Joel, you mentioned uh, scaling up 
uh, from technologies from large chemical companies. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioned about uh, you know certain compliance areas that you have to navigate through, which is which, you know regulated industry, which is a concern. Uh, Kevin, you mentioned the word super purification. I think that's that's a that's a very neat term that you use, uh, especially during these COVID times. And I know you're working on COVID related uh, technologies. My next question is, what do you think is the, and I always believe there's a soul of a company. What, what do you think is the soul of your company that allows you to do these neat things that you all do? Uh, what keeps you going every day? Because it's, it's challenging to be an S, you know, small, mid, mid-sized business. That's, that's challenging enough. But then to keep going every day, uh, especially in these COVID times, I'd like to understand that and share that with some of our attendees. So Jennifer, if you can touch on that, please. Sure. I mean, happily, uh, I would say our the nature of our business is obviously we are a for-profit business, like like everyone. We are we are in this to make a profit, but by nature, our uh, our mission is to eliminate needless pain. Um, and our founder's mission has been to um, to to put these this technology into into the world to make healthcare more easily accessed by people who might otherwise not access healthcare. Um, and what keeps us going is literally on a daily basis, we hear from a patient who uh, someone's father was going to stop dialysis because he was just, he had such needle fatigue, couldn't face it one more day, but she bought him a buzzy and set, that changed his whole outlook on, on, on his treatment. So, I mean, obviously that's an adult. We hear that from, from kids in the oncology ward, um, you know, who are just getting poked and prodded multiple times a day. Um, our technology is, it's affordable, it's accessible, it's easy to use. It has 50 clinical trials supporting its efficacy. So it's, um, it, it, it's literally every single day we hear from somebody who tells us that Buzzy changed their, their life or made their their healthcare more manageable. So um, it sounds hokey and silly, but it's um, it's obviously wonderful to hear that, um, especially for our, our founder who, you know, has, it's very difficult to be a medical doctor and trying to enter the, the device world. It's, you know, as though never the twain shall meet and she's found a way to, to make it work. And that's obviously because of her expertise, obviously with a lot of help in Atlanta's ecosystem that is designed and geared toward getting uh, ideas to the marketplace. So it's mission and purpose. That's, that's yeah. what you said keeps you going. That's awesome. It really is. Kevin, would, would you like to take a stab at that? Sure. I, you know, I, I think the thing that really gets our team motivated is, is, is problem solving. You know, the, the good thing about our business is, we're, we're always being exposed to some new application to no, no customer's application seems to be identical to the last. And so for us, there's always a, um, an interesting story, uh, an interesting problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, we have various tools and different ways that we can address it. We have to work with customers on all sorts of restrictions that they might have, whether it's budgetary or, or footprint or delivery time or anything to that degree. And um, I think we have a, a very entrepreneurial type staff that really likes to work in those kinds of that kind of environment and to solve, to deliver a solution mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and hear that it works. Now, unfortunately, usually we, we just hear when it doesn't work. We don't typically hear when it does work really well. Uh, but fortunately, we, we hear that it does mean we, 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 uh, we get a lot more success than we have uh, uh, any uh, issues as far as that goes. So, uh, but, but it is, and, and we work through a network of independent sales reps that are in the same kind of mentality. These are all problem solvers that are delivering solutions to customers. And, and that's just a fun way to come to work every day. Things are just different every day. And we're working with different people around the world and different problems. And, and it just makes it uh, a nice place to be. Interesting. Interesting. Joel? Well, I'll, I'll echo some of what Jennifer and Kevin both said. I think, um, one, you know, when we founded the company, we had these pillars that we were going to work in food, water, uh, you know, health, this sort of thing. And 
20 years ago, that sounded good, but you know, these trends we identified were emerging. Today, these trends are articulated in UN sustainability goals, and we can point to these ideas of what impact our products and ideas can have. So there's a, there's a, a strong desire within our group to, to continue to try to develop things. And sometimes, like I say, it's the smaller problems that we can, uh, we can help with that uh, really are the coolest ones. Uh, but like Kevin said, we've got technology that every day can be different. Uh, so, you know, we're, we enjoy, a lot of people look at our website and go, how can the one little group be doing this much? We're doing that much because this sort of technology and the chemistry we work with really can solve some unique problems uh, in different ways. And when you look at COVID, we're talking about, uh, we developed a very simple product to treat an N95 mask. And it, anybody can do their own mask. Uh, we did that back when it was H1N1, not COVID, but we dragged it out again for the COVID times. But it's very simple technology that every person could deploy if they they had such a need. So um, a lot of that is what keeps us going, keeps us excited. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'll now, I'll now shift gears a bit as to going and taking a deeper dive into your business and more so now. So, you know, one of my questions was, has 2020 been different? And of course, I struck that question off saying, you know, of course, 2020 has been different. So how, how do you think 2020 has been a unique year for you? in context to your business, in context to your exports, because I think we're going to start taking a deeper dive into your exports part of uh, the company. So if you can help us make that transition into that section. Jennifer, would you like to go on that? Sorry, I was muted for a second. I have a, I have a dog and children here, so I try to stay muted. While... <laughs> um, what, what the 2020 for us started on a high note, we were able to, to go to a huge show in, uh, in Dubai, Arab Health, um, at the very end of January, beginning of February. And that's actually where I had our, my first face-to-face -face meeting with our now India partner. Um, and of course, shortly after that, the world shut down. Um, so normally I would be seeing that my India partner at Medica next month in November. Now that's a virtual show. That's not happening. So I mean, those are that's those are very obvious um, observations that we're not able to meet in person, not able to travel. Uh, but for us and for a technology that benefits from touching and feeling to understand how it works, um, not being able to have that that in person um, uh, demo is is challenging. So we feel very fortunate, especially since we're talking about India today, we feel very fortunate that that happened to be our sort of last sort of big, um, a big event on the world stage and that we were able to sort of solidify that relationship. Um, I think in this particular case, our partner in India is very eager and they're very engaged. We stay in touch with them on a biweekly basis. They call it our fortnightly call, which I think is you know, not a term most uh, American English speakers would use. So um, we, we joke at, at um, what we affectionately refer to as the hive where we work as our fortnightly call with, um, with GCV, our India partner. So I guess I would say that's been a, a change for us is staying in touch on a more regular basis like that by phone, uh, Google Hangout, Zoom, et cetera, with our partners that we would typically expect to see once or twice a year when they're coming through Atlanta or we're going to see them. So just having to get a little more creative about staying in touch. That was a key show before, uh, before everything shut down. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that, that had been my first time in, in Dubai and at that show. And it was everything I, I expected and more. It was, yeah. 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 Well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you started that connection for India before everything. Uh, and yeah. I hope it keeps moving along. Yeah, I think it will. Yeah. Kevin. Yeah. So 2020 has certainly been a difficult year for us. It, it, uh, it hasn't been necessarily financially extremely difficult, but just from an execution standpoint, we typically grow about 20% a year. This year we'll be happy to be flat. I think we invested a lot in 2019 in order to be prepared for expansion in 2020 international uh, expansion specifically, I mentioned the personnel in Kuala Lumpur and the person in Hawaii was using Hawaii as a jumping 
jumping off point for Asia uh, and our Amsterdam office as well. So unfortunately, a lot of our personnel have been stuck in their offices trying to develop new relationships. And, and that's, a, that's a tough one to do. Um, you know, there's a lot that can be done by video conference. And I think we're all learning, of course, to, uh, to negotiate, to, to navigate that. But, but establishing a commercial, a new commercial relationship, I, I think is, is much harder. I think that uh, most of our potential um, customers and, and potential agents that we're working with are very interested uh, in it, but but are kind of waiting. And just as the world is kind of in wait mode, uh, waiting for this COVID thing to end, I think a lot of people are, are, are waiting until we can come and make that visit. We can solidify a deal. We can, we can take them on some initial sales calls. And so we've really been able to load our guns up a lot this year uh, and, and, and be ready for that, those visits. But because those visits are just really impossible to make, uh, at the moment, it's become difficult, um, and so we've we spent all our time getting getting things ready, getting being ready for when things do happen, uh, when we can make those visits. We actually do have uh, uh, somebody uh, visiting. We got special permission for uh, our business development person to head to Europe and spend a month in in Europe promoting our COVID product, um, and so things are starting to open up a little bit there, but um, it it. Uh, 2020 has certainly been an interesting one to, one to navigate. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Joel, how has it been for ICA? Well, I think uh, of the three companies here, we're the least uh, developed as far as uh, exporting. It's one of the reasons this call was uh, interesting in this whole format. This venue is interesting to us because we think we have, uh, as a Georgia company, some great ideas that could be, uh, could be done in India. Uh, but COVID really uh, was a game changer for us because, like I said, we've been involved in every biosecurity issue since anthrax. And when it happens, uh, people remember our products. Uh, so we were managing a lot of, of uh, growth, just making more products for more people, putting them in play uh, with a lot of first responders uh, doing a lot of different things. Uh, and with that came not only the manufacturing growth and management, but it came with the application side. You know, how do you do how do you solve problems that people hadn't talked about before? Uh, the other thing that we've seen is this food security thing has really grown. Uh, and so the um, application of our products are taking on new importance uh, as people look at the global challenge there. And then I think the third thing that we've benefited from is it's a regulatory one. Uh, when you look at working with the EPA and, and groups like that, FDA, you're trying to get products that need registration for claims through um, certain things in air uh, that we've worked around for years were not always recognized through protocols and existing sorts of approaches to vet your science. Uh, and now we see the regulatory community catching up and accelerating ideas around those things. So in the future, we'll have uh, better um, things to offer to the market, I think. Got it, got it. So if I were to summarize, uh, I'd say past relationships, you know, just before COVID, that, that was helpful to all of you. Uh, and then, you know, finding partners uh, who had those relationships either on state side or uh, in the target market that you were planning to, you know, get in deeper uh, would, would be something that you'd be looking at. So that was interesting. Uh, as far as exports and the mix, has it been different uh, and I know each of your companies are growing, so it's it's kind of a tough question uh, because especially if Kevin, as you said, you know, 20 20 percent a year, that's you know, wish wish our four hundred one k's grew that much, right? So uh, uh, you know, taking that as a as a benchmark, what percent? I mean, have your exports uh, are they are they growing? Are they stalling? Uh, do you see the U? I, I mean, I I know some of uh, some of the answer to these questions, Joel, from speaking with the U.S. Much difficult market because of regulations being so tight. Is there, is there some, uh, and I know Jennifer, you work on class one devices for medical grades and stuff. So if you can talk about us from your perspectives, how exports, how do you view as exports? Is that, is that, oh my God, export or oh my God, export, you know? And uh, if you can touch on that a bit. I personally am in the very enthusiastic about exporting field. I mean, I think 
Uh, it's no secret that 70% of the world's buying power is outside of the US. So we, we ignore the rest of the US at our peril and, and at our loss. Um, for us, we typically, um, we've been about 10% of, of revenues from international. We ex expect that to grow as we focus more on uh, B2B um, opportunities. Uh, a lot of pharmaceutical manufacturers, of course, based out outside of the US. Um, there's, Son Sanofi is one who comes to mind. We're um, uh, talking with them about um, a vaccine program that would be global. Um, and this, this is no secret, I'm not opening up the kimono too much here, but we obviously, pharmaceutical companies are our um, biggest target coming up. So we very much expect that B2B component selling our technology, either via licensing or the actual devices to uh, those manufacturers to incorporate them with their uh, vaccine protocols or injection protocols for people taking those at home. So I would say we've, main, we've maintained relatively steady even during 2020. Um, one challenge we've seen is just um, credit and access to cash flow for our partners. We typically um, require either prepayment or at least 50% payment before we ship. Um, and that has been challenging for some markets like um, Brazil, for example. Um, there, it's cash flow, flow challenges on the part of our partners has been a challenge for them buying. But um, aside from that, which we have some flexibility to, to work through, um, we have maintained um, steady with exports and we do expect to, to grow. We thought 2020 would be that year of, um, I shouldn't use the word explosive growth, but um, certainly in connection with the development of a COVID vaccine, we expect um, more more of a spotlight on our technology. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, Kevin? Uh, Hoshi, we have uh, traditionally, or we've, we've grown to about a 20% export uh, business, uh, at least through 2019. We expected 2020 to be a lot higher, but it's actually going to be less. We're, we're dependent on our domestic uh, business. Uh, a lot of big project work that we were doing, uh, especially in the Middle East, has been put on hold. Uh, and so that's definitely affected um, our, our sales or shipments as far as that goes. We, we do see a lot of activity there and certainly do expect that um, our, our trend towards a uh, higher percentage of, of the international sales is going to continue. Uh, but uh, 2020 will certainly be a little dip in that in that uh, ratio, because uh, just with all the with all the issues going on, everybody just seems to have a lot of things on hold uh, with it. So um, uh, we just keep we're just keeping everything on hold and following up with it, and making sure that when it does come on, we're ready for it. Thank you. I think what Jennifer touched on the credit crunch. I mean, that's that's very real. I mean, if you if you can't collect, uh, being a small to medium sized enterprise, I mean, it's game over, right? So. Uh, that's that's a serious factor that we all need to think through uh, as to you know everybody gets excited let's let's you know pump up our exports well if, if you can't collect it's not not a good sale right rule number one <laughs> we've we've heavily relied on the US exim bank bank for that and uh, that's really really proven to be uh, a great tool for us that we've been able to take some orders because we've been able to offer exim uh, payment assurance and uh, and our our competitor clearly wanted money up front for the project. We were able to give them better terms because of, because of Exum, and and we won the project because of it. Well, see, this is really satisfying to hear. As you know, I'm on the board of the Georgia Deck, so uh, exports is our game, and that's what we want to promote. So the Exum Bank helping somebody, you know, that that I'm hearing firsthand. Of course, I hear it for a lot of, you know, by the numbers, but seeing actually the face of uh, individuals who the Exim Bank helps is, is very gratifying. What services, and if you could touch on that for a second, what services do you use of Exim 
And uh, you mentioned about securing payments. That's one. Mm -hmm. How how did that work out? Did you reach out to them? Did you know them from the past? If you can share. I I knew them from uh, the past uh, and found that when we started going into um, uh, international work, that that was going to be important. Uh, And and it certainly was. Uh, We we found, you know, a lot of international customers are just expect to have to pay up front and we're more than happy to take that. Uh, but but many of them want to be able to leave something on the table. And, and they certainly like the the idea of 50% down and then 50% uh, after shipment, something to that extent. And uh, being able to use Exim to, to vet these customers, first of all, because we do get a credit report back, uh, an international credit report back on these customers when when we apply for exim insurance for for them basically or for for the uh, for their purchase uh, to to know what kind of a payer they are, but then uh, to have that assurance. Fortunately, we've never had to make a claim uh, with it, and uh, but but it's nice to be able to you know let these people know that we're happy to give them the exim insurance, but. They, they should be very careful to make sure that they do pay because the federal government is behind the collection of this debt. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's nice to have the power of the federal government behind us in, in that transaction. It's always good to have that visual of Marines coming down a Black Hawk to take the payments, right? I mean, that's, that's always something that works that's out. Right. Yeah, we, don't, we know it wouldn't quite look like that. It would be more like a swift, a lock of a swift bank account or something. But uh, no matter what, it, it wouldn't be pleasant. Joel, uh, would, you, would you like to take that question? Have you in the past used uh, uh, any export program? There's some of these bigger challenges that Kevin and Jennifer are talking about because we're still new to the game. But I would say that uh, and we enjoy something a little bit unique in the world of food interventions. There are a lot of big international companies we deal with that are very helpful when they like your products, getting them into places like Russia, China, India, uh, if they want them. But the hurdles that we still face are often regulatory ones. So, you know, if we have EPA approvals here in the United States, it's not a matter of just saying that another country will look at those and go, yeah, that's great. We will do the same thing. Today, many, many of these uh, countries are sophisticated. India's got a very sophisticated chemical policy that continues to emerge uh, that has impact on the kind of things that we want to bring to bear. So um, those are the kind of challenges that we have to keep an eye out for. But again, if we're going to grow, uh, exporting is going to have to be a big part of our thinking. And I think, I think Joel, uh, as close as some of us are to your businesses, uh, I think yours is just at the, at the cusp of making that big leap and you will be requiring these large, uh, you know, the, these Exim Bank and, and the guarantees and stuff that we're discussing. Uh, because what, what your company has from what we've studied is a very unique product that as you say is mobile and can be applied across a variety of fields. Uh, and of course, you know, there's few people who do that, but what you've been able to do based on your experience uh, is truly unique. And the approvals that you've received uh, for the use of this product, because in, in, in your case, I mean, you've explained it in the past when we've had some offline meetings, it's the residue on the produce. It's the, you know, is, it, is, is anything left that's still coming through as we disinfect and stuff like that. And you all have really mastered that. So that's something, you know, technology side, I think you all are pretty locked down tight. And now it's just a matter of expanding out into geographic markets is what is what we visualize the stage that your company is at. So hopefully you'll have all these problems in the near future. We can hope. Yeah. Uh, guys, what trends do you see uh, currently changing or helping you in your growth uh, for each of your companies uh, after COVID? I mean, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned about the vaccines. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for those kind, that kind of input. Is there specific markets? Is it global? Uh, you know, what, what do you see as the next opportunity because of COVID? Well, obviously, like you mentioned, um, the, the hopeful um, vaccine that, that I think the, the world is holding its breath for. Um, in connection with getting people ready to, to take the COVID vaccine, we have seen an opportunity to, um, to have people 
uh, understand that Buzzy can help them with their flu shot. There's been a huge push for people to get their flu shot, so we avoid this uh, this so-called twindemic of the flu and COVID hitting at the same time. So a lot of the um, a, a lot of what we're seeing on the news uh, about educating about the importance of flu vaccine uh, sort of in yours to our benefit, we're able to sort of co-market and sort of adopt that same messaging and point people toward um, toward but toward our technology where they might otherwise you know, not get their flu season, their flu shot regularly or annually, like, like we all should be doing. Um, other trends we're seeing is essentially for our first 10 years of, of Buzzy's life, the, the first, the first device, the first sale of our device was May, 2009. So I would say for at least the first half of our existence, we were having to educate even clinicians and healthcare professionals that um, offering pain relief is important to the patient experience. So that's a, a trend we're seeing is that there's genuine acceptance in the marketplace that pain relief is something that should be considered and should be offered if you're offering um, a satisfactory patient experience. And of course now um, with the ACA, people and uh, providers are actually getting graded on whether they offered sufficient pain relief in connection with, uh, with a patient experience. So we're seeing finally years later, some of those, um, those trends around patient-centered care uh, benefit us. So we hope that's only going to improve. So Jennifer, just to follow up to that, uh, and, and if there's anything proprietary, of course, don't touch it, but do you all manufacture in, in the United States or do you manufacture overseas? How does that uh, work out in, in the we, global markets? So our, our technology is this vibration device and um, the ice pack. Both of those have in the past been manufactured in the U.S., um, but we've in the last few years, we have moved our manufacturing back to China where we originally began. Um, and it is really largely based on expense. I mean, we were very happy with our U.S. manufacturing. Uh, it just became uh, challenging from a from a cost perspective. Um, so, were it, were any supply chains disrupted during this time? Did you experience any of that? We did a little bit, and primarily again because we manufacture in China, we had sort of the double hit of Chinese New Year. And then almost immediately yeah. in connection with that um, COVID shutting down. So we definitely, we have had a couple periods of time where we have been out of stock on, like, for example, Amazon is our biggest consumer sales channel. So we've been out of stock on our most popular item on, on places like Amazon, just waiting for the, the ship to arrive in port. Um, so yes, we've had, I would say, thankfully, minor supply chain disruptions, and it's certainly that that double hit of Chinese New Year and then people not coming back from Chinese New Year because of, um, of COVID hitting. Do you see the need for manufacturing these in the market that you, like, for example, in India, if you're targeting India as a market, do you see the need for manufacturing in India, regulation-wise or otherwise, is be, being a regulated industry, hence my question. Yeah, I um, we definitely, we recognize the need to have more than one manufacturer and certainly India is a, is a manufacturing location that makes a lot of sense for our type of device. Um, our current partner has asked us about this idea of licensing and manufacturing in country. So certainly that is on our horizon as a way to grow um, in India particularly, but certainly to have India as that sort of second manufacturer um, to just serve what we hope will be a, a growing demand for our products. Got it, got it. Uh, sorry, I asked you too many questions at the same time. Kevin, do you, do you remember the original question? How is, co how is COVID gonna change your trend uh, of the company? I think you're on mute, Kev. So it has uh, caused us to pivot. We we began taking a look at some alternate technologies um, out there, which we had been, oh, let's say next door neighbors to uh, in the market, and we're able to combine uh, the technology of one company with the operations of, of another company, and and actually developed an air filter material 
uh, which is highly antimicrobial. And so we've pivoted from removing gases and odors to also working uh, in the microbial field as well. And so we've developed a product, uh, have some initial sales of the product, and it really are in the middle of the product launch for this fabric material that goes inside of an air filter, which uh, is 99% um, uh, effective in killing COVID and, and other viruses. There are actually viruses out there that are harder to kill than COVID. Uh, but uh, we've been able to actually get it tested at a laboratory against COVID, the COVID-19 uh, virus, which is called the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, virus, uh, as well as a number of others. And so we're excited. Uh, that's almost a whole separate business that we've created out of this whole thing. So we're going to have to figure out how we're going to go about with that. Um, at the moment, we're trying to figure out who our customers are. We don't think that we're going to be the people who are selling the actual air filter that goes inside of your furnace. We think that we're going to be selling this to the companies that make those filters. And, and that's who our initial sales have been to. And um, uh, so that's been exciting. We've had to learn a lot. Um, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot that's not known about viral um, antimicrobial properties and how to get rid of viruses and such. Um, and so we've learned a lot. It's been very interesting. And um, it was nice to make use of a little bit of downtime during the whole COVID period to uh, to chase after a different market. So COVID actually allowed you to, you know, use your, your uh, assets and your reach uh, to look at something that would be the need for the hour and mm -hmm. getting the best technology to build, you know, use your distribution reach and then, you know, take it to market. Right. Uh, and, this, and this all actually came out of a webinar too, which is very interesting because, you know, webinars are all kind of a new thing to us. We're, we're in it, but I was, I was a, a panelist on a webinar and one of the other speakers is there and he started mentioning something and then I mentioned something. And then we had an offline dialogue uh later on about hey are, are you doing anything here and well we're kind of doing this and uh and then i was able to put together a couple of other people and and we were able to quickly put something together that uh, looks like it it could be pretty promising awesome so this this word pivot has become the operational word in the uh, pandemic and this is a real example of how you pivoted uh pure air into into a whole different area Joel, I know your your ICA Trinova has been doing a lot of interesting things over the years. Uh, whenever there's a pandemic, uh, it, it's it's called upon to do its part. You know, anthrax. I remember that that part. Uh, H1N1, as you mentioned, that's that's in the memories. So, have you have you been doing any specific work or due to COVID? Are you even allowed to say that you treat COVID? I mean, where, where do things well, stand? Uh, we've done work with a lot of different viruses. Like Kevin said, um, airborne transmission of disease is not a new subject matter. It's something that's been talked about around the world for a long time. Uh, we started working in this space, like I said, when it was anthrax spores. But when you deal with bacteria and viruses, they're, they're easy to kill. But if they're on the move, like we've learned with COVID, we, we have a new challenge uh, that filtration and certain types of devices may not be complete enough solution sets. So we've worked in this space and we do have some uh, interesting data that we're, we're leveraging. But you mentioned trends. And to me, the biggest trend that I think COVID is stimulating is this idea of biosecurity. And biosecurity, whether it's people or whether it's animals, and I didn't really talk about the animal health part of what we do, uh, is become the buzzwords. We're seeing issues with virus transmission in the, the swine industry that are pretty severe and are challenging the marketplace uh, to raise swine, uh, feed people. Poultry is the same thing. We've got some feed additive type intervention technology we're developing that could affect salmonella and the crop of the bird. And uh, poultry is a, a huge market in India. You know, it's about a $2 billion market in India. So um, trends in biosecurity for people, animals, uh, they're all in play. And I think COVID has amplified these sensitivities and people are looking for antibiotic resistant, um, you know, trying to get rid of these organisms, use less antibiotics. We have a, a challenge with just creating antibiotics anymore in the drug industry. You know, people don't wanna make them. They're not good return type of uh, technology investments. So things that can deal with organisms with new ways and in new places are gonna continue to be important. 
interesting i didn't even think of the 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 uh, as you said the animal side of biosecurity that's that's a whole different area and i'm you know pretty first hand familiar with the swine flu uh because my past company did a lot of work in that area uh and then when you mentioned poultry i mean you know here's georgia i remember sitting in the grand hyatt in shanghai and uh they brought out a chicken dish to me and i said wow that looks nice is that local they said no 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 flown all the way from georgia <laughs> i'm like really that's interesting <laughs> this was a few years back uh i don't know if they still do that or not but that was interesting uh guys i think i'd like to take some questions there's uh there's a few questions popping up from the side here uh and here's dan usher dan thank you for joining uh from start your question is from your startup to now how have your respective businesses made critical choices around international expansion very good question dan meaning how do you prioritize which geographic market to pursue in what in what order which applications uh, or key choices and I, i'll i'll leave this open if any you know however you want to organize this but uh, that's that's those are very good questions thank you dan well maybe i'll i'll chime in cuz we're simple we're not as developed as the other guys but for us um, i mentioned regulatory challenges and so when we look at the landscape of where we want to go Regulation is a key thing. And can we leverage what we've created in the States and another country is important uh, because uh, some of these things can take years if you have to develop new data sets that aren't new. They're the data set that you have, but you just have to do things in country. So that has been part of our prioritization thinking. Um, I'm happy to go next. So um, for us as a regulated device, um, it's it's sort of multifactorial. I mean, first we look at what you might consider easy markets and I don't wanna criticize India, but I would not put it in that category of easy markets. So for, um, for a US based company like us, there's the obvious um, Canada, Mexico, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, like familiar from a language standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, those make a lot of sense. Uh, so the, e the path of, of ease of exporting is certainly one of the first questions we get to. As a regulated device, the next one is, can, can we export? So you think Canada is our obvious largest trading partner, but for us, Health Canada views our products with a higher level of scrutiny than does our FDA. So that's been a, just sort of a hard stop um, for Canada for uh, over the last 10 years in spite of incredible demand in Canada. Um, we are working toward that, but for us, it's a very expensive um, hurdle to overcome. A lot of uh, uh, regulatory certifications that are you know, upwards of $50,000 between consultant fees, uh, application fees, et cetera. So as a, as a very small company, there is that sort of decision-making process. There's been a point where we said, you know what, we're just not gonna be able to, to, to do Canada but we've recently gotten some NIH funding that is going to allow us to, um, to travel that regulatory path. Um, the, other, the other thing I would say in response to Dan's question, thank you for it, by the way, um, is that early on as a startup, I would say we were very reactive, almost 100% reactive, meaning that someone came to us, they saw our product online looking for needle pain relief, they found us, they said, you know, my daughter's diabetic, I wanna be your partner in, United Kingdom. And we were just so happy to be discovered that we said yes to those early inquiries without really um, being a little more strategic about what we needed in a distribution partner. So over the years, with the help of uh, Georgia Department of Economic Development, the US Commercial Service, and lots of other um, uh, agencies here in Atlanta, um, they've helped us develop that sort of ideal profile for a partner. They help us with um, like those um, credit testing, um, the, the credit reports that I think um, Kevin mentioned getting from, uh, from the, bank, the banking side of things. We're able to get those at a no charge basis from uh, Georgia's trade and export office. Um, so we have definitely traveled from a low level sophistication and very reactive from a, from a strategy standpoint or a no strategy standpoint to a much more strategic about the markets we 
want to export to. And there are times we just say no based on um, you know return on investment. There's only one of me. Um, we just can't can't serve the world as much as we'd like to. Jennifer's uh, comments would uh, mirror mine, uh, or my my comments would mirror uh, hers. So uh, we we did find it very easy to uh, enter into our neighbor markets in Mexico and Canada. Those were very very similar to uh, U.S. markets, with the, with the difference being that typically we're not able, at least in our early days before we were work, working with Exum, we weren't able to offer credit into Mexico. And we certainly can now with Exum. Um, and then there were other markets. I, I remember uh, having a hot deal, a uh, potential deal in China and flying uh, from Atlanta to Beijing for a one day meeting and then flying home because we were going to have this, this great deal. Uh, but the Chinese market is very, very difficult. Uh, and you can walk away from a meeting there where everybody's saying yes, 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 yes. And then you never hear from them again. And after uh, uh making a number of those trips to certain markets which uh, were high growth markets but ne really needed a lot of uh, attention and especially in-country attention uh, we did uh, definitely divert our attention from those markets um, and uh, and focus on let's say uh, pro-american import uh, markets um, and that we that we could get into and um, and then just in the past few years have have uh, uh, re-entered into the into the markets that uh, were more difficult prior. Now that we've got a little more experience under our belt and uh, have, you know bigger name in the industry and uh, and have more people on the ground locally, uh, we've been able to do that. Well, I remember. Uh you know, you and I making a trip to China together. I don't know what year that was, but it was the year when uh, we used fax machines, Jennifer. So don't don't try to uh, pin any of our ages here. <laughs> and we had a fabricator. I don't know if you remember, Kevin, this was years back. And uh, we would we would pull our hair out sitting here in Doraville, Georgia, trying to figure out why our faxes don't go through to our fabricator. And uh, when we were there, we learned that they like to switch off the fax machine when they go home. That's right to save to save electricity. <laughs> to save electricity. So that was that was a good learning moment. <laughs> I, I think both our heads, our eyes just turned together. Kevin and mine, <laughs> we looked at each other and we went, "Huh, there's one puzzle solved." <laughs> uh, okay. Well, let's. Uh, Joel, would you like to just take a stab at that question? Well, I think I, I think you I threw the in my defense in the beginning, but Good. Yeah. I, I was having a senior moment there, guys. Okay, let's uh, let's go to Indu Sharma's question. Uh, great question. What challenges do you think the coming year will bring, keeping in mind the pandemic situation? And I'd like to add that because I've I've been a part of a few scenario sessions where you know uh, I think they were held by McKinsey and trying to figure out when, what, what does the recovery look like? And I've seen recovery paths uh, as far out as quarter two of 2022 uh, and some, you know, stating the second quarter of 2021. So given that context, can you, can you touch on how you see at your companies what the next year would look like? Well, I, I'm happy to start because I've actually just talked with our um, partners in India about this, um, what their expectations are, what their challenges are. One thing they're telling me is that they're, they have a network of, of clients they've worked with for years. Um, so they have ready contacts um, to introduce our technology to. But what they're telling us is that those, uh, those existing clients are really focusing on their core businesses and bringing back those core businesses rather than bringing on something new and exciting and potentially something that could you know, make an improvement but is not necessarily an essential uh, technology for their core business. So th that's a challenge I think is people sort of, you know, just keeping everything to, to shoe level or getting back up to, to where we were in 2019. And sadly, for a technology like ours, that's sort of a nice to have technology, we may not be included in that sort of getting back to normal 
we're sort of the after you're back to normal, you add us as a, a marketing um, uh, dis distinguisher. Um, and the other challenge I see is we've talked about this a little bit is that um, access to credit, access to cash flow. Um, our, we've had a couple of our partners very specifically um, ask for uh, credit terms where they never have before. Um, we've had a couple who have asked for more time to pay than what we originally agreed to. And I suspect that that's only going to get worse. But Kevin just reminded me of, of XM opportunities. So that's something we've not taken advantage of. And that's certainly an opportunity for growth for us, I believe. Great. So, uh, you know, what, what I'll tell you is that I, I predict that in the upcoming months, we're going to see um, some uh, hopefully factual and science-based um, opening of uh, restrictions in regard to COVID. Um, so if you take a look at the COVID restrictions that we're working on, there's national, regional, and corporate level restrictions that we're, we're all having to work with on in order to visit with customers. And I, I can tell you for us, it, it is absolutely imperative that we meet in person with our customers. We have proven over and over and over again that our success rate is very, very, very high. And when, when we can do that, and what I have uh, am frustrated by is the current COVID restrictions just seem to be very blanket uh, oriented restrictions. So for instance, for the millions of people who have had COVID, you know, according to the CDC, the specific recommendations of the CDC is that these people do not have to social distance, at least for a few months. They are known to, to not be able to transmit or to be able to get COVID again. And so what I'm hoping is, especially when the vaccine comes out, because there'll have to be some way of identifying the people that have vaccine, is that people will smarten up and say, well, if you had COVID within a certain period of time, hopefully some organizations like the CDC or the Pasteur Institute uh, we'll be able to give some guidance on that. If, you, if you've been confirmed to have been diagnosed and you're clear of it now, if you have the antibody test and you have it now, or if you have had the vaccine, then, then you're, you get the green light to go anywhere. And that really should be, this should be something that's coming through from the well, World Health Organization, which of course is, is really, in my opinion, let us down worldwide as far as leadership in regard to this whole effort here. But that ought, there ought to be some type of a, of a certificate or something that you're uh, immune to this and, and that you can make travel and that these customers should be happy to see you and you've yeah. come. And, you know, it's for these people who have gone through this terrible illness as well, that, that ought to be something that uh, is something that benefits them. Well, I, I, I feel your pain. I mean, you, what you're touching on is exactly what, uh, you know, if you have bad debts, well, one way to solve them is to stop doing any sales. Yeah, right. Right. So right. that's not that's not the approach. And I, I appreciate what you're saying. We need to get a little bit more granular rather than uh, a yeah. blanket. Mm -hmm. uh, man, I see a bunch of... Go I ahead. hate to jump in, but I, I heard a physician say a, a couple months ago before we knew much about where we are in the vaccine trial process that uh, proof of vaccination is going to be our ticket to getting on a, a, a plane for international travel. Yeah. And that was absolutely devastating to me, knowing how long it takes um, a vaccine to come online. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I fully, guys, we have a couple of minutes and I see a, a few questions pop up here. Uh, would, do, you have any, do you have any parting remarks or can we keep taking the Q&A? Go kill, keep going with the Q and A. Okay, awesome. So, uh, if that's okay with Jennifer and Kevin, also, I'll I'll sure. read through some of these questions. So, is the world underestimating the business impact of COVID nineteen? Uh, that's one. I think we've touched it in different forms. Uh, the rapid adoption of distance work. Does that mean jobs are going to be more exposed to outsourcing? And decoupling of the U.S. and Chinese economies, I realize I'm asking you three questions at the same time and there's one minute left. Uh, but I figure whichever you have the stronger answer to, you may choose from that. Uh, is the decoupling of the U.S. and Chinese economy is now inevitable. What will that mean for your businesses? Very, very good questions. 
Uh, the only thing I'm going to say is that I think the myth of the decoupling of U.S. and China economies is uh, greatly exaggerated. I do not see that happening. And I think the evidence of China manufacturing growth over this year refutes that, that claim. I'm no, I'm no economist, but that's... That's what Absolutely. I, I think they'll just be kind of an evening maybe of the of the playing field, but uh, our economies are too dependent on each other for a decoupling for sure. Got it. Got it. Okay. I have a question again from Dan. In which ways may your export or international business change longer term or permanently due to the impact of COVID? Is there an aspect of your business that you risk it changing permanently or it doesn't really apply to your businesses? Well, I just say from our perspective, COVID is creating opportunities. So I, I mean, not that I think COVID is a great thing, but it's, it's a thing that has awakened people to certain types of security problems across the board that we have technology to, or products to solve. And so we see opportunities as this goes forward down, down the line is there'll be greater sensitivities for people looking for solutions. Uh, from what I've heard, I'll, I'll close now. I've heard each of you state that India is a key market for your businesses. Uh, that's, that's a place that uh, you either are doing something today or you see yourself doing more of it. Uh, there was a comment that we touched on saying it's not the easiest market uh, to consider in your priority. And that's something that uh, we have to that's not a market by priority that you choose to go. I heard Canada, Mexico, UK, New Zealand, some of the other markets. So clearly there's some work that has to be done jointly between the US businesses and the Indian uh, business setup. And that's a part of uh, why these uh, events are being held by the UIBS. So I thank you for participating. Thank you for taking your time. Uh, and I hope this was as worthwhile for you as it was for us. So thanks again. Very much. Thank you, Hoshi. Thank you, Joel. Thank you for having me. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Jennifer.